Welcome back to The Political Correction. Sunday is a special day for Christians, but we acknowledge that faith comes in all shapes and sizes. So each week here on The Political Correction, we aim to talk to someone at the heart of his or her community to talk about what brings us together. In other words, our common ground. And this week, our very own Arlene Foster spoke with Canon Gavin Ashenden, Catholic layman and writer about the big issues facing us today. Let's hear what we have to say. So I'm delighted to say that this morning we're joined by Gavin Ashenden. Gavin is British Catholic layman, author and commentator. Gavin, what have you been thinking about this weekend? I think one of the things that's troubled me most um, is the morality of international politics. Because um, the way in which the media, at any rate, present some of the issues we're dealing with is to uh, is to present everything in black and white terms as we know who the goodies are and who the baddies are. And uh, this, was, this was always problematic. Um, anyone involved in, in, in law or politics knows that you only have to lift the surface of things a bit and you suddenly discover some contrary indicators underneath. But it's much more problematic today in a way that I really don't yet understand. Mm-hmm. What I mean is that, that we've had two years of COVID with an extraordinary mono narrative in the media and now we've got this dreadful conflict between the ukraine and russia and uh, there are always two sides to everything but we only ever get one side and that's not saying i want to pick one side over the other it's just saying i feel enormously uncomfortable so i thought rather than rather than discuss russia and the ukraine for the moment i'd go instead to iran to, to mrs um uh, mrs zagari Radcliffe, because she's been released and many of us have been praying for her Mm -hmm. uh, and for the family for some time because the situation she faced was simply um, a nightmare and utterly terrible, separated from her daughter, whom she'd only seen for the first 12 months, from her amazingly courageous husband. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then suddenly she's been released. And we were never quite told in the beginning that, that, that she was being held as a a ransom hostage for 400 million pounds, but slowly it became clear. And this was a debt going back to 1979. Well, now we've paid the debt. It, it, I'm glad I'm not a politician because I wouldn't know how on earth you value the life of an individual like that against sums of money that, that are inconceivable. But we paid the debt and she's free. The problem is in terms of the morality is a we now have access to Iranian oil, so that must be good for us. We're escaping Russian oil by choosing Iranian oil. But looking at what happens in Iran, yeah. it's no clear to me that the Iranian oil is a more moral source of oil than the Russian oil was. And worse than that, the price appears to be to be give uh, Tehran permission to gather together nuclear resources. Um, they're on a, the conditions are they don't do anything for two and a half years. But in two and a half years' time, one of the places that's going to be extremely nervous is Israel. Yeah. So this is this has been presented as a as a wonderful thing in the news, and and thank God she's home with her family. But the idea that we that we are making good, wholesome, moral choices in our international relations is is just not acceptable. It's it's um it's far more complex than that. And 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 I'm not pointing the blame at anyone. I just wish that the way in which we tell the story of international politics would accept the fact that we're we're contrasting one dreadful situation with another dreadful situation. And of course, that has been commented on um, by Tom Tugendhat, amongst others, who has said that the government has essentially paid a ransom, um, not just for Mrs. Uh, Zagari Ratcliffe, but also for the second gentleman who was released as well, the 67-year-old businessman, Anushi Azuri, who, who came home uh, to the UK uh, as well. Of course, the government says that the payment certainly was not contingent uh, on freeing uh, either of those two people. But it does bring us to the moral maze of international diplomacy, and I think that's the point you're trying to, to make, isn't it, Gavin? Well, it, it is really, and I, I think I'd, I'd go beyond that to talk about the, the demonising of Russians or the heroising yeah. of, of Ukrainians. Russians and Ukrainian people are they are both marvellous nations. They have their riches. They've both had terrible leaders as well as good leaders. Uh, the reputation of the Ukrainians after the Second World War was not was not one of the international highest for those who know something of the history of German prison camps. But but that's the point. 
um, what we should be doing is not demonizing nations or cultures, removing Tchaikovsky from, yeah. from uh, a, a concert program. We should be holding political leaders to account as they are and not doing this, this easy, cheap, and frankly, a very dangerous uh, notion of, of demonizing a, a whole people or even a whole culture. And it's just, I think what surprised me is there are so few voices in the media saying this. There are a few, of course, few sensible, wise people. And yet the whole thrust of the onslaught of our, of our media presentation is to do this cheap, dangerous, and frankly, utterly racist thing. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we have such appalling double standards in this. Well, it's something that we have been discussing on the political correction for a number of weeks now, the whole backstory to how we got to this position with Russia and Ukraine. But as you say, uh, also in relation to uh, the fact that whole um, peoples are being um, designated as Putin supporters and, and Russians who are just simply trying to get on with their everyday lives are, are being targeted. But if we look then at your second issue, Gavin, you wanted to talk about the source of news and where we get our news from. So uh, there's always a cup half empty and a cup half full. I think one of the things I've most enjoyed is discovering Russell Brandt. I was a great <laughs> critic of him. I, I, thought, I thought he was a very naughty, shallow, silly, uh, clever, silly man. And I can't tell you how angry I got when uh, he played that trick on poor Manuel. Um, and uh, left um, Me left too. that awful Me message. Too. I mean, he was off his he was off his head at the time. Of course, he was. And I said to myself, I hope this man gets kicked out of public life forever. We never see him again. And yet, Russell Brandt is turning out to be one of my saviors politically. That is because he has this really very effective YouTube program. I think he's got over five million listeners now. Um, it, it's quite clear he was always an intelligent man, but. He's moved from a sort of zany Buddhist, pseudo-Buddhist spirituality uh, in a direction that, that frankly attracts me greatly, which is closer and closer to Christianity and uh, more and more explicitly so. He's not a Christian yet, but he's, uh, what I'm encouraged by is the fact he's begun to see that, that, that Christ, you know, everyone has to have, a, everyone does have a, a philosophical or a spiritual or a moral lens on the world. Mm. And what we ought to be doing is choosing the one that works best. And I like the fact he's discovering this works best. What I also like is the fact that he's saying things that are wholly unacceptable in the rest of the media, and he's saying them by sourcing them and analysing them uh, and, and presenting them in a way that, you know, because he's, a, because he's halfway between a left-wing radical and, and a kind of weirdo anarchist, just, by, just psychologically, you know he's not in bed with anybody, um, but instead what he's trying to do is to get to the truth. Now, there are very few sources of, of of commentary in our news where you get that kind of raw integrity. Joe Rogan in the States is one of them. And I've watched a bit of him and I like him very much. And again, I'm astonished at the way in which they've been trying to close him down. So one of the reasons for bigging up Russell Brand is because I, I can't believe they're not going to try and close him down at some point. Yeah. And I've, I've found him a very helpful source of, uh, of, of, of the analysis of both sides of the argument in these very difficult recent uh, months and years. Well, it seems as if you've come full circle on Russell Brand, uh, Gavin, and uh, uh, that's a very interesting story in and of itself. The third issue you wanted to raise was an issue from Scotland. I have such trouble with the idea of racism because although we've been talking about racism since I was a child, when people would put up horrid and unpleasant uh, placards like... Um, uh, no gypsies or no Irish or no Jews or no, uh, you know, no people of colour, whatever. And these were obviously uh, execrable and uh, everyone knew that they were. And it's wonderful. They're out of, uh, they've been flushed out of our system. But the concept of racism has run away with this and has become immensely dangerous because it's essentially a thought crime. And what it suggests is that you can work out what someone's thinking in their head. Mm -hmm. And then as a Christian, I would say in their heart. Um, from from what they do and what they say, and the fact is, people are more complex than that. And it's it's really even Elizabeth the first said she didn't want a window into men's souls. She didn't want the government to peer too deeply into the privacy of who we are and how we're motivated. But it becomes completely nonsensical. So one of the phobias that we've had belonging to racism is Islamophobia, and the extraordinary 
discovery in one of the Scottish council that actually many of the local Scots uh, are not so much that they, they, they hate the English and they fear the English more than they hate and they fear Muslims. And that is such a, that's such an, it does two things to me. I mean, first of all, it's an indictment of our relationships with our neighbours, because really, you know, of course we're in friendly rivalry, but, but, but actually we're all human beings living only a few hundred miles apart. And the other is that you, you just swap one form of, the moment you engage in, in the public examination of racism, you tend to end up by swapping one form for another in the sense that we're all racist in that we all have the capacity to be prejudiced against other people. I, I very much like the Christian antidote to it. The Christian antidote simply is love your neighbor as yourself. And mm. if you actually take that seriously, you can't be racist or it, it works against any, uh, any instinctive, flawed, racist tendencies any of us might be left with by the human condition. But, but the difference between saying, let's encourage each other to love each other by itself and pointing the finger at racist hate crimes, catching the Scots for their anxiety about the English or the English about the Scots is, I, I think, ridiculous. One of the things I'd like to do in the public space is to, for us to give less time to the thought crime of racism, because I think in the end it's run away with us and it's become meaningless as a way of trying to improve the way in which we live together with our neighbours. I never thought that we'd be discussing the so-called white privilege uh, in this part of uh, the programme, but <laughs> I presume that you're not a big fan of white privilege either, Gavin. Well, it carries with it a sting in the tail because, I mean, as words so often do this, it's a kind of, have you stopped beating your wife yes. question. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever answer you give, you're in trouble and you're wrong. And so the question shouldn't have been put like that. Whenever anyone talks about white privilege, I say, look, I'll accept white responsibility. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll accept the fact that my forebears got to the scientific revolution first. And some of my forebears, actually, the, the best of them being the Scots, got to the industrial revolution and engineering quickest. And that's given us a degree, not of superiority, but of responsibility. Yeah. Uh, and once again, the, the problem with the diagnosis of, of social ills from the left is they always end up by giving you two things. A guilt by association and and, uh, and taking away res personal responsibility. So I'm very happy to own up to responsibility for having um, having been given a, a, a generous education by some kind people and living in a part of the world where I've been resourced. So my responsibility then is to share that with other people. But to to tell me that there's something intrinsically wrong with the group I was born into, you know, actually that's a bit sick. And, and the shame is we should be calling this sickness out in public much more than we do. And I presume, uh, just to finish then, Gavin, that you're, you weren't really impressed with Nicola Sturgeon's decision to pardon <laughs> the witches that had been uh, punished 500 years ago. <laughs> well, that, that raises so many questions, but let's stick to the easy one. The, 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 the easy one is... Uh, retrospective legislation. I, I started as a law student once upon a time and I wanted to be a lawyer. I remember the earliest rule was retrospective legislation stinks. It's always immensely dangerous. And I think that, that also applies to pardoning people who, who, who've lived an inconceivable long time ago for things that we have no idea about. I couldn't judge if we had. The problem is what she's doing is it's a form of, virt it's a form of political virtue signaling. Yeah. And actually, it's disrespectful to history. It's disrespectful to, to, to the earlier cultures. Um, it's using people for political gain and advantage. And again, I'm afraid I think she should be called up on it and told, look, this is, this is not an honourable way of leading a political life uh, in, our, in our present day. Gavin, thank you so much for joining us on Common Ground, where we try to find the common ground between all of our different faiths. Thank you so much.